the tagline goes, some houses are born bad. Well, maybe some movies are too. To be fair, it seemed like a solid recipe to start with. One of the most famous haunted house stories of all time. Brought to life for a new generation. The director of Speed and Twister, two blockbusters that captured the public's imagination. A producer in the form of the ultimate Hollywood showman, Steven Spielberg. State-of-the-art visual effects, a top-tier production team, and a cast that included Liam Neeson, Lily Taylor, Owen Wilson, and Catherine Zeta-Jones. Hell, even Stephen King was nearly included on the impressive roster. The ingredients were all there, so how and why did this can't-miss ghost story produce more yawns than gasps? Never fear, we'll diagnose the problem and find out just what the f happened to the haunting. The story of how the remake materialized begins with two of the most geek-friendly Stevens in the business, Steven Spielberg and Stephen King. Spielberg had been a longtime admirer of the 1963 Robert Weiss film The Haunting and considered it a classic. In the mid-90s, he was looking to launch an update on the material, which led him to King. Many years earlier, the two unsuccessfully attempted to collaborate on another ghost story, which ultimately became Poltergeist. At the time, King seemed unwilling to bend to Spielberg's impulses, saying in an interview, Spielberg is somebody who likes to have things his way, and mused that he would have just been utilized as hired help on the project. Spielberg called King one day and said that he wanted to, to quote the author, make the scariest ghost story ever made. This led them both to agree to use Shirley Jackson's brilliant novel, The Haunting of Hill House, as a jumping off point while also deciding to use the famous Winchester house as inspiration, at least in terms of how the house would look. In addition to its backstory involving a place that literally looks like it was meant to be haunted. But as had happened on Poltergeist, the creative process just wasn't as smooth between these two titans. As King later said in an interview, Spielberg was focused on making the characters heroic, and for the movie to have a sense of adventure in the Indiana Jones mold. King naturally just wanted his characters to be terrified. King said that it was a battle for the soul of this movie between the two of them, and the disagreement ultimately led to King leaving the project. But as it turned out, he did not leave empty-handed. The ideas he came up with for The Haunting would eventually be used in the ABC miniseries Rose Red, which is about a team of psychics entering a haunted house with predictably ghastly results. Moving on from The King, Spielberg went in a very different direction in the form of up-and-coming scribe David Self. Spielberg had actually flirted with directing the script for a moment, but ultimately decided against it. Still, Spielberg was obviously impressed with the newbie writer and offered him The Haunting, which naturally Self couldn't turn down. Spielberg was very involved in the writing process, injecting his ideas into the story that would be more inspired by Jackson's original novel than the 1963 movie. One example that Self noted was when Spielberg called him out of the blue to declare there had to be a scene in the movie where the audience sees a child's face in bedsheets. This inspired by a moment when the legendary director and his child were playing with a silk sheet and he saw her face spookily pressed against it. It's been rumored over the years that Spielberg himself intended to direct the horror film but opted not to when another opportunity came along. That opportunity being an opening in Tom Cruise's schedule. Spielberg and Cruise had long been looking for a movie to make together, and now they had their chance. Minority Report. A project Cruise had been championing for quite a while. Trouble was that Twister director Jan de Bont was supposed to take the helm of that film. But when Spielberg and Cruise's schedules aligned, the DreamWorks co-founder offered The Haunting to de Bont and essentially gave himself Minority Report. Hey, when you're Steven Spielberg, you can do pretty much anything you want. But pivoting to the mostly interior sets of a horror movie might have been just what the doctor ordered. After Twister, DeBont made the critically reviled box office bomb Speed 2 Cruise Control and was in the mood to make something different. He would later tell Entertainment Weekly that it felt good to be in a situation where he didn't need to rely on weather, traffic, boats, buses, or tornadoes. 
While the spooky exteriors of the film's antagonistic manner were shot in England, the massive sets were constructed in Long Beach, California, in an old airplane hangar that once belonged to Howard Hughes. Oscar-winning production designer Eugenio Zanetti was hired to create what he would call the shining on the sets of Citizen Kane. These sets were going to be costing approximately $10 million of the film's reported $80 million budget. Hired to bring it all into focus was cinematographer Caleb Deschanel, father of Zoe and Emily, and three-time Oscar nominee. But Deschanel left the film after only a week of filming, thanks to those pesky old creative differences with the director. Replacing him was Carl Walter Lindenlob, who'd handled splashy visual effects-heavy movies like Stargate and Independence Day. And The Haunting was slated to have a lot of special effects. After the film was released, one would have to agree that it might have had too many special effects. While the house is certainly a pivotal character in the film, it would be joined by a handful of actors to play off of. Liam Neeson was cast as Dr. David Morrow, who invites a handful of eccentric test subjects to a haunted house in order to study how they handle fear, without telling them that's the purpose of his study. Lily Taylor, more of an indie darling at the time, was given the lead role of Eleanor, who forms a strange bond with the spirits in the house. DeBont would later say that they were looking at bigger names for that role, but she got it thanks to the vulnerability that she would lend the character. Cast as the seductive Theo was Catherine Zeta-Jones, who broke onto the scene a year earlier in The Mask of Zorro, a part she received because Spielberg had recommended her to director Martin Campbell. Yes, we even have Spielberg to thank for Catherine Zeta-Jones becoming a star. Finally, Owen Wilson, then still somewhat unknown, but a rising star thanks to turns in Anaconda and Armageddon, was the final piece in the main ensemble, playing skeptical smartass Luke. Wilson would eventually end up improvising some of his dialogue with DeBont's blessing. Shooting the film would prove to be something like working in an actual haunted house. DeBont arranged at least 50 sound effects, from creaks to loud bangs to moans to play throughout the set in order to freak out the cast. Turns out that Eugenio Zanetti's sets were just as effective on their own, with Zeta Jones saying that she'd never be caught dead alone there after dark. One interesting challenge involved Liam Neeson and his acrophobia, which is the fear of heights. You'll see plenty of documented cases where the actor admits he's afraid of being up high in any situation, so it was certainly difficult getting him to climb a set of swirling, unsteady stairs in one of the movie's most memorable set pieces. DeBont admitted that it was very hard to get Neeson to perform some of the scene himself, though the really dangerous stuff was left to a stunt person. Apparently just filming that scene took an entire week. Shooting began in November 1998. DreamWorks had already given the film a July 1999 release date, a tight turnaround for a big-budget, effects-heavy film. Rumors that it was not an easy shoot began to trickle out, and as the production crawled towards its release date, the news hit the trades that reshoots were in order. Screenwriter Michael Tolkien, of the player fame, was brought in to rewrite some of the script, and according to an Entertainment Weekly article, Lily Taylor went back and forth from New York to LA at least four times in order to shoot new scenes. She's quoted as saying that she felt like her brain was going to split open from having to revisit the character over and over again. Spielberg himself was linked to the reshoots, and depending on what you read, it turns out his and DeBont's visions were exactly aligned during the editing process. DeBont claimed Spielberg would visit the set from time to time, but only involved in shooting an additional sequence that DeBont himself could not attend to. Spielberg's trusty longtime editor, Michael Kahn, cut the film, and perhaps a sign that Spielberg wanted things going his way. DeBont would later say he initially envisioned more of a character study focusing on Taylor's Eleanor and her connection to the house but the film eventually became about fake shocks and weak jump scares, many of those added after production wrapped. In a 2020 interview, DeBont called those elements totally phony. When all of the effects, post-production, and behind-the-scenes drama was completed, The Haunting was released on July 23, 1999. Despite some very negative reviews, the film made $33 million during its opening weekend, on its way to $91 million domestically, and $180 million worldwide. While not a smash hit, it made its money back, 
though there was no doubt that a sequel would be unnecessary and unwanted. As a footnote, Spielberg would get another shot to adapt Hill House about 20 years later, when Amblin co-produced the ambitious Netflix miniseries directed by Mike Flanagan. To be fair, the series isn't a direct adaptation of Jackson's novel, but few would disagree that it's a very well-told supernatural epic and much more effective than de Bond's film. What still does stand out about the 1999 movie is the wonderful look of it. It's easy to ignore the excellent production design amidst the clunky dialogue and unconvincing visual effects. But if you're tempted to revisit the film for any reason, be careful to pay attention to the glorious work by the production designers. This house may have been born bad, but it was built with the best of intentions.